Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We often hear people talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this, uh, of course, is the most important relationship in your life. Acknowledging this, however, immediately raises the subject of our text from the Bible today, the subject of prayer. Because at one level, prayer is just talking to God. And it is the most basic requirement for any relationship. If there is no talking to each other, If there's no listening to each other, no communication taking place, how can we say that we have any relationship at all? There no doubt are many people today inside and outside the church who profess personal faith in Jesus Christ and yet rarely, if ever, spend any extended time at all with him in prayer. And what does that tell us about the state of their relationship with him. The great uh, 17th century English pastor and theologian John Owen said, it is axiomatic, it is self-evident, that theology, what you believe about God, it is axiomatic that theology finds its true expression in prayer. And that prayer is the clearest reflection of theology. In other words, if you want to know what someone truly believes, don't listen to what they say. Listen to how they pray. Or, as the case may be, listen to whether or not they pray. To discover whether or not there's a functioning relationship there. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his studies in the Sermon on the Mount, points out that prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man, he says, at his greatest and highest, he is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. And because of this, Lloyd-Jones says, prayer is the ultimate test of one's spiritual condition. There is nothing that tells the truth about us as Christian people so much as our prayer life. You will find that the outstanding characteristic of all the most saintly people that the world has ever known has been that they've not only spent much time in private prayer, but that they have also delighted in it. The more saintly the person, the more time such a person spends in conversation with God. And then Lloyd-Jones points out, John Wesley used to say he held a very poor view of any Christian who did not pray for at least four hours every day. Now, before you shut down and quit listening to me or get up 
and leave, uh, let me just say a couple things about that. Number one, John Wesley would have had quite a poor view of me as a Christian by that standard. It's the first thing I would say. And secondly, let me say that you would not be as crazy as some people think if you adopted just such a radical practice in your own life. There are far worse things that you could do than to spend four hours each day communing with your God and Savior. But know something else. that Another thing I really appreciate about Lloyd-Jones is his honesty. Because a little bit later he says, see if you ever feel this way, everything that we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. God knows it is very much easier, he said, to preach like this than it is to pray. And so there's hope for those of us who find it difficult to pray. It means that we're not the only ones. And if you fall into that category, I have great news for you today. If you find yourself challenged to pray on a regular basis, my first word of encouragement to you is this, that the Holy Spirit will help you pray. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit will help you pray. How? Now, we've often heard that, said, we know it's in Scripture. How does the Holy Spirit help us pray? Well, John Owen says, the Spirit of God is not formally the one who makes supplication. He works in and through the believer's prayers. Creating, here's how he helps us pray, he creates a gracious inclination toward the duty of prayer. And giving a similarly gracious ability then to discharge it. Owen sees both assets included in the statement of Romans 8.26 where it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness when it comes to prayer. Here's what that means. It means that if you've ever had a desire to pray, if you ever get that desire and you feel prompted to pray, guess what? It means that the Spirit is at work in you. The inclination to pray is grace from God the Spirit. And what's more, if you ever actually pray, it is because the Spirit graciously grants the ability to pray to you. So, prayer, understand, from start to finish, is all grace. It's all grace. God graciously invites us into his throne room to pray. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. He doesn't have to do it. But he opens the doors and says, come on in. Cast your cares on me. I care about you. Find grace to help you in your time of need. He graciously invites us into his throne room. And then he graciously inclines our heart to pray when we're there, and then graciously enables us to follow through and pray, which then causes all the benefits of prayer to flow into our lives. This is amazing grace. That's my first word of encouragement to you. If you find it difficult to pray, the Spirit will help you. Here's my second word of encouragement that I have for the prayer-challenged Christians today. It is, It's that the wisest, most intelligent, insightful, sensitive, mature, and authoritative teacher on the subject of prayer that the world has ever known is willing to teach you and me how to pray. He teaches us how to do it, and he does it right here in this text. Our text is found in a context. And today's text is the second of three examples of public righteous deeds that Jesus urges his followers to practice without ever having anyone know about it. Three practices that we're supposed to do and no one else has to be aware of it. Last week, it was anonymously giving to those in need. The text that follows today's text is the practice of fasting from food. 
making sure that no one knows when you and I fast. Today, right between those two, Jesus, as the master teacher, calls our attention to the highest activity of the human soul, prayer. And he begins by laying down a few rules of prayer, followed by a model for us to follow when we pray, and finally a test that will help us maintain the proper attitude when we pray. Let's begin in verses 5 through 8 with the rules of prayer. You could think of these as the do's and don'ts of prayer. Verses 5 to 8. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've already received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. See that theme of reward that we saw last week? It's all woven here too. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. So once again, prayer is not only logically necessary if you're going to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's also his expectation for anyone who would follow him. He doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. And then he gives us some do's and don'ts. And the first one, verse 5 is, don't be showy. The first thing the master teacher brings up about our prayer life is that it should not be showy. And this can be a challenge when you have to pray in front of people because we suddenly find ourselves forgetting about God and concentrating on how I'm coming off in front of the people who are listening to me as I pray. And Jesus says, don't be like that. And he goes on to tell us that there's a word for those who care more about others when they pray rather than God. And the word is hypocrite. I looked it up. Hypocrisy is the woman who says, I can't believe this, both my boyfriends are cheating on me. That's hypocrisy. Then I looked up the same theme. On a, I found it on a couple of these uh, summy cards. They're like the little funny postcards that touch on this same subject. The first one said, funny... My Bible doesn't have the verse about how love is demonstrated through criticism and self-righteousness. Or this one, I'm so glad you told me what a good Christian you are. Judging by your actions, I never would have known. (laughs) This is hypocrisy. Why does Jesus call people who are showy in their prayers hypocrites? Why? It's simple. Prayer is about talking to God, not pretending to talk to Him. When you pretend, you're a hypocrite. That's rule number one, according to Jesus. And it comes with its own limited and temporary reward. Don't be deceived. It can be done in church. He says synagogues in Jesus' day. And it can be done in public, out on the streets. But that's rule number one, don't be showy. Rule number two is do pray much in secret. Verse 6, Jesus says that when you pray this way, in secret, you will be rewarded by God the Father because when you shut the door and go in your room and are quiet and no one else knows you're there, God is there and he hears you and he sees you and the real benefits of prayer, the long-lasting benefits of prayer come when you practice secret prayer. There are many times in the New Testament that Jesus prayed in front of other people. He prayed in public. The apostles did the same. It's not that you always have to pray alone or that you're supposed to avoid praying in public. 
we are just to make sure that we, when we do pray, are talking to God and not going through the motions so that we can impress others. When we do practice public prayer, it should merely be an extension of our private prayer life. And in fact, when you think about it, if you are not talking to God more in secret than you are in front of others, then something is wrong. A couple of months ago, Heidi and I took our oldest granddaughter out for steak dinner. She has very refined tastes. She uh, likes shrimp, she likes lobster, and she likes steak. So we took her out for a steak dinner. And um, as we often do, uh, before we sunk our teeth into the juicy meat, we paused, bowed our heads, and prayed. A little bit later, as we were waiting for our check, a big, burly, cowboy-type guy came over to me, leaned down, and whispered in my ear, I love to see a man pray. And I wasn't expecting that at all. And it just, it touched me. It meant something to me that he would say that. But I have to say that it also presented me with a temptation next time that I pray. Subtly lead out in public. The temptation is to hope that someone will notice and that someone will say something so then I can just sort of feel a little more self-righteous. That would be the temptation. Pray much in secret. That's rule number two. Rule number three is don't be thoughtlessly repetitious. Now, we have to make a careful distinction here. A repetition, as it is used here, is not the same as persistence in your prayers. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable to teach his disciples to pray and never to give up. Persistence is good. Mere repetition is not. But repetition is not necessarily bad. Think of Psalm 36. Many of us immediately bring that to mind when we hear Jesus teach this because in Psalm 136, there's this phrase, for the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. That's repeated over and over and over as you work your way through the psalm. It's not that you can't repeat yourself when you pray, even in a a corporate responsive prayer. But what is prohibited by Jesus here is praying something over and over so that you're not even thinking about what you're saying. Mindless, mechanical repetition. That's what he's against. Some translations interpret the word here as babbling. Don't babble in your prayers. Or as the ESV puts it, heaping up empty phrases. God is not impressed by the sheer quantity of the words and prayers that you give. Why? Why does that not impress God when we just pray over and over the same thing? Why? Rule number four. Do believe that your Father already knows what you need even before you pray. Now, why would Jesus add this comment? So that we don't get deceived into thinking that prayer is informing God about our situation. Or that prayer is trying to convince God of the urgency of the need. He knows. He knew, he's always known. He knew before he even created the world. Everything about your life. In fact, we could say more than that. He ordained it. He designed it. He's up to good in it. He knows what he has allowed into your life and he knows where these particular circumstances are going to lead. You're not informing him of of anything when you pray. He already knows. Remember, Psalm 8, 26, already referenced earlier. We don't even know what would be best for us to pray. We need the Spirit's help in our weaknesses and limited understanding of our current circumstances to even know what we should ask for or how we should pray. Let that truth shape your prayers. Don't just rush into God's presence demanding what you want or what you think is best 
or what you think is most urgent. Well, what is prayer about then if it's not trying to inform God of your trouble? Or if it's not trying to change God's mind? Or it's not trying to get things to turn out the way you really want them to turn out? Well, then what's the point? I will let you contemplate that one as we look at the way Jesus teaches us to pray in the model that he gives us in verses 9 to 13. The model that he gives us here is intended to be a general pattern of how to pray and what to pray. Verse 9 makes that clear. Pray then like this, it says. Martin Lloyd Jode says this prayer is undoubtedly a pattern prayer. The very way in which our Lord introduces it indicates that. He said, pray then like this. He didn't say, pray these words. What we have in the Lord's Prayer is a kind of skeleton. You could uh, think of it like scaffolding. It covers everything, and all we do is we're supposed to take these principles and employ and expand them and base our every petition upon them. And as you begin to look at it this way, I think, Lloyd-Jones says, that you'll agree with St. Augustine and Martin Luther that there's nothing more wonderful in the entire Bible than the Lord's Prayer. He taught it, not that they might just repeat it mechanically for the rest of their lives, but rather that they should say to themselves as, when they're going to pray, they should say things like this. Now, there are certain things that I must always remember when I pray. I must not start speaking at once without considering what I'm doing. I must not merely be led by some impulse and feeling. We can never do anything greater or higher than to pray along the lines of the Lord's Prayer. What is the pattern that Jesus sets for our prayers here? Well, there are countless ways to analyze the prayer and, and a seemingly endless number of books written on it. But personally, I find it helpful to focus on the five themes that Jesus emphasizes in this model. And each of them are asking God for things that God has already taught on or promised us in the rest of Scripture. These are not like new things. Jesus is pointing out things that have already been promised to us. This is important because, as John Owen wrote over three centuries ago, we are to pray only for what God has promised. Only what God has promised to do in the Word can be the theme of true prayer. What God has promised, all that He has promised, and nothing else are we to pray for? For the secret things belong to the Lord our God alone, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But the declaration, the revelation, we would say, of his will in his word, the declaration of his will and grace, this belongs to us, and this is our rule as we pray. The promises of Scripture, properly understood and applied, are the grounds of all assurance in prayer. Well, what then are the themes that should inform our prayers? Or another way to ask it, what is it that we are to want more than just being delivered from pain or threatening circumstances? What is it that we're to want more than just what we might be feeling at any given moment? According to Jesus, first, we want awareness of God's fatherly love and sovereign reign. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. These are two things that Jesus holds together as he prays. First, God is my Father. He chooses to relate to me in this way because he has graciously chosen to relate to me as the perfect Father in love. 
He is patient with me. He is tender with me. He is always committed to pursuing what is best for me, even at great sacrifice to himself. This is true fatherly love. And I should always keep that in mind as I approach him in prayer. I'm approaching my father. But the second part of that is, Jesus always remembers when he prays, uh, that, when he prays that this father reigns over all things from his throne in heaven, in the heavenlies, in the heavenly dimension. He is, in other words, he keeps this in mind. Yes, he's my father, but he is addressing the holy, almighty, eternal God who is an all-consuming fire. Think here of Deuteronomy 4, verses 23 and 24. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now think of that with regard to prayer. When it comes to asking God for things, don't make something more important than God. As Calvin warned us, our hearts are just like these factories. And what do they produce all the time? Idols. Just like there's this conveyor belt running out of our heart of idols. We all have an inborn tendency to make things that we desire or that we set our desire upon more important than the glory of God and the advance of his kingdom. And so what happens is we, we make our little idols and then these are so precious to us. And so then we pray, we pray, oh God, please, please protect this idol. Don't take, don't take this idol from me. Just help me to be able to have this idol. And so we then bring our idols to God, pleading that he'll preserve, that he'll give them to us, that he'll preserve them. No, no. He's your father, yes, but he's a father who is also the holy God of heaven and earth. And remember that both are always true and that what God has joined together, let no one separate. God our Father in heaven. Which brings us to our next theme. We want an overriding passion for God's glory and kingdom and will. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed, hallowed, be your name. Your kingdom come. Not mine. Your will be done here on earth the way it's being done in heaven right now. I still draw inspiration for my own faith from what happened must be three decades ago now when a young mother of three from our church discovered that she had cancer and not very long to live and it was a very sweet time. They invited me to come over uh, one evening and spend a night with the, an evening with the family, with the three children there on the floor and a husband holding her hand. And we sat that night and we opened the Bible and we talked about what heaven was going to be like and what it would be like to die and pass into the presence of the Lord. And then when Jan and her husband came to the elders for prayer. We were ready to anoint her with oil and lay hands on her and pray over her, just like James 5 says, when we asked her, how would you like us to pray? And she replied that God's will would be done, that he would be glorified in this. Now, think about it. Longevity health, even her precious husband and children had not become idols to which the God of the Bible must bend. Her passion was to see his name glorified and his will done with the same fullness and delight and immediacy with which it is being carried out in heaven right now. 
For me to live is all about Christ and to die is gain. So whether I live or I die, let his name be hallowed and lifted up. Let his name be glorified. This is always our highest plea when we pray. Pray like this, Jesus says. Third, we want humble day-by-day dependence on God's provision. That's verse 11. When you pray, pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. What kind of a father would God be if he gave us everything we asked for? Our lusts and greed would destroy us. But he loves us too much to do that. Instead, Jesus teaches a humble trust as we pray that God would give us just what we need for today. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. There are probably all kinds of bad things out there. I'm not going to go there. I'm not even going to let my emotions go there. There's enough trouble in every day to, to keep, you know, to, to worry about. I'm just going to... I'm just going to focus on today, and I'm going to trust him for today. You may recall one of my favorite quotes from Jeremiah Burroughs and his work from 1648 called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, in which he says, Christians find that what really makes them happy is wanting only the things that God chooses to give them. Their happiness arises not from the gifts that they receive, but from their willingness to be satisfied with what God gives them. They are learning to accept that God's will is best. And as time goes by, Christians find increasingly that the source of real happiness is God Himself. In heaven, He will be the only source of our happiness. So if he's not the source of your happiness now, you don't want to go to heaven. He'll be the only source of happiness there. Many who have battled addiction have found this to be a lifeline for them. Living one day at a time. This is Jesus' teaching. Ask God to give you just what you need for today and then trust his wisdom and love in the midst of it today. One day at a time. Fourth theme. We want realized relational forgiveness. We want to receive that kind of forgiveness and we want to be generous in giving it according to verse 12. Forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. In other words, Christians are not just those who have experienced forgiveness. They are glad and generous forgivers. So in one sense, it's just so easy to declare, my sins are all forgiven. But for Jesus, it is always a matter of the heart, isn't it? And and when Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us, he's now making it a matter of the heart again, isn't he? Genuinely forgiving those who hurt you or betray you or commit injustice against you is being like God. And it demands a righteousness that is not just like a shallow veneer on the external part of you. You need, if you're going to forgive genuinely, you need the Spirit of God who forgives that way. You need the Spirit of God in your heart to truly forgive others. So pray like that, Jesus says. Confess your sins, yes, but then surrender your Tempting inclinations toward bitterness. Surrender all of those to him. Fifth, we want to be kept from evil 
and sustained in righteous living. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. D.A. Carson comments on this verse, Many pages have been written on this petition, but I suspect the real explanation of this puzzling phrase is simpler than most of the proposed solutions. I think, he says, that this is a light disease. I had not heard that phrase before. Light disease. It's a figure of speech which expresses by negativity the contrary. A light disease uses understatement to make an emphatic point. So it would be like if I come over to your house and I try your homemade creme brulee. And then you say to me, well, how was it? And I say, not bad. Now, when I say not bad, I don't mean not bad. I mean, it's amazing. But I say not bad. That would be a light disease. So here Jesus is saying, don't lead us into temptation. It's an example of a light disease. He's negating into temptation. And what he's really saying is, get me out of here. Don't let me be, don't let me stay there. Keep me protected from it. Get me away from it. As the next phrase expresses it, don't abandon me to the evil one. That's what we're praying. Carson's conclusion, this petition is a hefty reminder that just as we ought consciously to depend on God for our physical sustenance, so also ought we to sense our dependence on him for moral triumph and spiritual victory. We never stop needing the Lord. It's all grace. So this then is... Uh, our model of prayer, our guide to prayer, our pattern for prayer. Keep God's love and sovereignty together as you approach him. Prioritize above all else a passion for God's glory. Trust him day by day for what you need. Rest in and freely give forgiveness. Turn from evil into righteous living. Build your prayers around these themes. That's how Jesus trains us to pray. But there's one more point that he makes before he moves on from this subject. The test of prayer given in verses 14 and 15. For, see that at the beginning of verse 14, that connects 14 and 15 with the prayer, the model prayer he's just given us. For, that means this is the ground of what he's just taught us about prayer. For, it's going to become a commentary on the prayer. For, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We're supposed to let the weight of this hit us. As long as we refuse to forgive another person, our prayer for our own forgiveness will not be answered. And remember that this is about a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you will not forgive someone else when they sin against you, well then how can you enjoy a relationship with God based on having received an infinitely greater forgiveness yourself from Him? Your forgiveness of others doesn't earn you forgiveness from God. It confirms that it is real. And by praying this way, the genuineness of our hearts is tested and revealed. The, the forgiven will forgive. That's his point. And if you're not willing to forgive another, then you don't pass the test of genuineness in praying this pattern of prayer. In the words of Jonathan Pennington, this is meant to drive home the weightiness of interpersonal relationships among God's people, the church. How important this, it's our Father, 
our daily bread. This is a corporate prayer. We pray this, and it also then underscores why it's so crucial that we keep short accounts with each other. This does not contradict justification by faith, but shows that a revenge-seeking heart is clearly not one that has believed in God's forgiveness of sins. The highest activity of the human soul, the ultimate test of the spiritual condition of our hearts. Let's pray. And so, Lord, Jesus, our master teacher, our king, our savior, we ask that you would take these words which you taught so long ago and you would write them on our hearts that they might inform our prayers, that they might guard us from idolatry, that they might nurture within us a priority on your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. That prayer would not be something we engage in to get just what we want, but that it would transform us into living first for your kingdom. We pray this because you deserve it. We pray it that your name would be glorified. We pray it for the good of your church. Through Jesus Christ, amen.